Hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Glenn Opigard. I've been a developer on the Tracker team for about four years now. And I originally came to Pivotal from the Cloud Foundry team at VMware. And uh, my name is Mark Michael. I've been with Pivotal for over 10 years now. Started off on the consulting side of the house and ended up moving over to Tracker. And now the, I'm the engineering director for Tracker. Speaking of it, what, what is Tracker? How many of here, how many people here have heard of or used Pivotal Tracker? Awesome, that is really good to see. For those of you who haven't, Tracker is a SaaS-based project management tool built around a shared prioritized backlog and emphasizes collaboration and transpar transparency over configuration. Thousands of companies rely upon it every day, and when it goes down or has issues, our Twitter account and support desk light up. It was also Pivotal first Rails app, originally meant to introduce Pivotal clients to Pivotal's agile methodologies. And back in 2006, Pivotal was in the old flood building on Market Street. And the rooms looked like a little bit like that. And you might not recognize that person back there, but he kicked off Spring One on Tuesday. That's Rob Me, Pivotal's current CEO who was the inspiration of Tracker and one of the first pairs on it. And its first home looked a little bit like that, a server closet or something like that. Before getting into how to avoid the million dollar AWS bill, we wanted to take you along Tracker's hosting journal from a server closet to its current home, spoiler alert, GCP, the benefits and downsides of each and some of the things we've learned along the way. Tracker started off as an internal tool with dozens of users, mostly made up of labs and, and its clients. And as I talked about earlier, it was running on a server closet. Performance was OK for its limited use, but scalability and availability wasn't great. There were a number of nights and weekends that we had to send someone into the office to restart the server. Tracker's popularity among Pivotal's clients continued to grow. And we realized that we needed a more reliable home. In 2007, we moved Tracker to Remove Hosting, running on a single VM with a monthly spend of around $100. Availability and scalability was slightly better, but maintenance and deployments was still highly manual. Tracker's popularity took a major step forward in the next few years as Pivotal's clients began introducing it to their friends and we outgrew a single VM on Remu hosting. Luckily, Pivotal had a partnership with Engineer, and Tracker found a decent new home, for a while at least. By 2010, Tracker had grown from tens of thousands of users to tens of thousands of users, and we started thinking about introducing a paid version. Then Engineer moved its hosting environment to Terramark. It was still free for us, but its virtualized global file system wasn't quite ready for a chatty web app like Tracker, and it quickly became a train wreck. And we needed a new home. That led us to Blue Box. Costs were reasonable at around 10,000 a month. Performance, availability, and scalability were great compared to Engineer. This allowed us to go paid in 2011. And Tracker quickly grew from tens of thousands of users to hundreds of thousands. Life was OK, but costs continued to increase to about 30000 a month, and updates and scalability got harder and harder, which Glenn will highlight in more detail. Thanks, Mark. So now Tracker is hosted at Blue Box, and I'm going to briefly review uh, what was involved for us to roll out security updates at Blue Box, as well as how we did deployments there. And later on, I'm going to contrast those processes to our current hosting environment. Uh, but first, I need to give you a little background on our Blue Box environment. It was a hybrid hosting solution, so the bulk of our VMs were divided across four dedicated host machines. But some VMs were in Blue Box's multi tenant service, and we also had a handful of bare metal servers running MySQL or NFS. So we've got a few dozen servers at Blue Box. Across them are running various versions of Red Hat Linux. The specific version and flavor would typically depend on the year and month a particular server was brought to life. And getting more server capacity required a lot of lead time. 
And it would start by opening a ticket with Blue Box, going back and forth with them about the server specs, and then waiting for hardware to be ordered, racked, and uh, put in their data center. And as you might imagine, our servers were not uniformly the same. They were custom built and configured ad hoc over a period of six years. Uh, they did not look like this uniform uh, picture of uh, blue box servers up here. Uh, they required ongoing care and feeding. They were hard to modify, scary to change, and difficult to reproduce. And there's an analogy in the DevOps world about treating your servers like a bunch of unique pets that require lots of maintenance and care. And the flip side of the analogy is treating your servers like a bunch of cattle, each one the same and easily replaceable. So at Blue Box, we were definitely caring for a lot of pet, pet servers. And now that you've got some context on our Blue Box environment, let's look at how we rolled out security updates. So at Blue Box, we were always behind on security patches, and it took a lot of work to roll out these updates. Let's take a specific example of updating our app server, which was Nginx and Passenger. So it was managed by the Ruby version manager, and given that this is spring one, uh, many of you might not be familiar with RVM. Uh, it manages multiple installations of Rubies and kind of wrangles all of the dependencies of our app. And I don't want to be too hard on it since it solved a real problem in the Ruby community, but I can assure you that if you have worked with RVM and you've tried to automate or script commands involving RVM, it's this unique uh, exercise in pain and aggravation. Now imagine trying to do that across dozens of servers with different versions of RVM spanning six years. Uh, so this was a no-go for us. So the actual process of trying to update Nginx and Passenger was manually SSHing across dozens of servers, downloading the Nginx source code, and compiling in the Passenger module. Uh, this was then followed by a careful deployment dance of deploying the new code, referencing the new version, out to each server one by one, so that we could manually update sim links on the file system pointing to the new version. And as you can imagine, this was very error prone, it was time consuming, and it produced inconsistent results. As far as operating system updates, um, we we're always behind on those too. Uh, we'd have to do this cost benefit analysis of what, how much time would, would it take to update across the fleet of servers, plus the risk of actually changing anything and we'd weigh it against the risk of the specific service needing a patch. We'd ask, is it firewalled or is it exposed to the public? Uh, is it worth it to reboot and take down 25% of our app server capacity at a time? So that was a, an example of what security looked like for us at Blue Box. Now let's take a look at what deployments were like. So we deployed every other week at Blue Box and we would spend a pair day dedicated uh, at Pivotal, we pair program full time, so uh, there's a de deploy pair of two engineers uh, working and getting a release out. And the deploy pair would start by cutting a release branch, then we would wait for CI to go green, then we would deploy it to the non-prod environment. Assuming that went okay, we would deploy it to our staging environment. Uh, about this time during the day, it's uh, going to be lunch, so we're breaking for lunch. Uh, when we get back, the testing team is doing regression testing. Then in the afternoon, uh, we schedule a go, no go meeting with product managers, the testing team, and the deploy pair. And if we're a go, we finally deploy to production at around 3 p.m. And so that's a brief look of what security updates and deployments look like for us at Blue Box in 2015. And that's when an interesting thing happened for us. IBM purchased Blue Box. And in May of 2016, we started hearing rumors about the fate of Tracker's traditional hosting environment. We got the official notice in August. Tracker needed a new home by the end of the year. First, we panicked. And I looked like Philip from, I looked like Philip from Futurama for the first few weeks. Tracker had been running on a hybrid isolated cl cloud for over six years. And now we had less than six months to find a new home with minimal customer impact. Previous moves were gigabytes of data and thousands of users with really no externally imposed deadlines. Now we had six terabytes of data with tens of thousands of companies that relying on Tracker every day. 
After we got over the initial panic, we broke it down into two main tracks. First, updating the app to run in the cloud and minimizing the impact on our customers. Let's jump into getting the app to run in the cloud. The first thing we set out to do was update this 10-year-old monolithic app to be 12-factor compliant. This allowed us to build out the necessary app instances, workers, and AWS data services. Once we had this basic structure in place, we set out to automate, automate, and then automate some more using Terraform, Cloud Foundry, and Bosch for our environment build out and concourse for our app builds and deployment. This automation allowed us to stand up test environments that were exactly the same as production, but with much less resources, which allowed us to confidently test the application before the production environment was even built out. It also allowed us to quickly stand up multiple load and performance environments and refresh as needed. The second track was focused on minimizing customer impact. We knew that anything over a four hour downtime on a Saturday morning would be a large burden on our customers. But most importantly, we wanted to ensure that we didn't have any data loss. The first thing we, we needed to do was figure out how are we going to transfer all this data to the new environment. Our initial attempt was to follow the recommended export import, but that method took over 10 days to, to transfer six terabytes of data. That was a complete no-go for us. We couldn't be down for 10 days. We started looking into database replication strategies, but quickly found out RDS only supported non-SSL-based replication, and we certainly didn't want to tra transfer over our customer data insecurely. With a little bit of ingenuity, we came up with a MySQL relay strategy that looked like this. We set up SSL-based replication from Blue Box to a MySQL instance running on EC2, it, which was inside of a virtual private cloud, or VPC. Then within the, the same VPC, we used non-SSL-based replication to the RDS instance. Now that we had a plan for data synchronization, we needed to make sure that our new environment was up to the challenge for production traffic. The last thing we wanted was our application to fall over or seem unstable on cutover day or the morning after. We had thousands of companies that relied on Tracker every day. And with Blue Box shutting down and the holidays coming up, we really didn't have a plan B. We needed to do everything we could to ensure a successful cutover. The biggest challenge on the load and performance front was the generating realistic traffic, not just random load. We tried out a number of different tools and ended up with the following. An army of EC2 instances starting up actual browsers simulating traffic from around the world managed by Terraform. A tool called Artillery to simulate WebSocket traffic from around the world. And a homegrown API load and performance script. We put this all together to generate a fairly realistic load. Finally, we used New Relic to fine tune and compare the results to our current production environment. In addition to running the load and performance tests under normal operations, we ran it during foundation upgrades, as well as simulated server and data service outages. This gave us a lot of confidence that our new environment could handle the production load and was going to be highly available. Finally, we needed to make sure that that the cutover could be done in less than four hours, as well as eliminating as many unknowns as possible. So we organized another track to come up with a cutover plan and practice it, practice it, and practice it again, moving our staging environment from Blue Box, cutting it over to our new staging environment on AWS. All this work resulted in a straightforward cutover of four simple steps. Shut down the old environment, swap the DNS, explore the new environment, remap the routes, and let the traffic come in, which ended up taking us less than three hours to accomplish, including time to test our new environment and take a short lunch break before going live. We didn't know what to expect, and, and as I said earlier, we didn't really have a plan B, so we had a large team on hand for the just-in-case situations. But we ended up with a large number of board developers and testers but lots of happy customers who were completely oblivious to the fact that we had just done a major hosting change. Now, let's jump into the benefits of PCF. So now Trekker's running on Cloud Foundry and Amazon. 
And if our blue box environment was in a menagerie of pets, each one requiring lots of care and feeding, Cloud Foundry gave us a herd of cattle, rather containers, each one exactly the same. So as a quick reminder, uh, this is what security updates were like on Blue Box. There was uh, lots of manual and error prone processes uh, involving SSHing to dozens of servers. So let's look at the same processes on Cloud Foundry. So to roll out an app server update of Nginx and Passenger, uh, we run this command to update our dependency, so bundle update Passenger Enterprise Server. Uh, we commit the change and then we CF push tracker, and then it's gonna roll out uh, the new Nginx and Passenger to 50 app instances reliably and consistently every single time. Uh, when we wanna update our version of Ruby, we change one line in our gem file, commit it, and CF push. And again, it's gonna roll out that Ruby upgrade to 50 app instances reliably, and consistently, every single time. And operating system updates aren't something that our team really has to deal with anymore. The Pivotal Cloud Ops team manages our PCF instance and they'll handle rolling out stem cell updates or platform updates. So in a nutshell, we're much more secure on Cloud Foundry. We've saved hours upon hours of time, uh, patches are rolled out faster, and it's resulted in much better security practices for our team. And now let's revisit the tracker team's ability to ship and deploy code. So deploy is on blue box. We spend a pair day doing lots of manual processes to get a new release out. On Cloud Foundry, it's all been automated. So at noon, our CI trigger, our CI system triggers a deploy pipeline which starts by cutting a release candidate. Uh, this is the Slack notification that we see in our deploy channel. Then it deploys that branch to a Canary app which our team calls on deck. And the tracker team's gonna use that Canary app for a day, dog fooding it and being on the lookout for any regressions. So if everything looks good in 24 hours and we haven't seen any regressions, our CI system auto promotes the Canary to production using a blue-green route swap strategy. So compared to Blue Box, we went from this uh, manual, time-consuming process to this automated, well-oiled release train that leaves the station at the same time every day. And if we need to pause the train, it's simply a matter of pushing the pause button in CI. And we got Canary apps and fast rollbacks, and they really gave us the confidence to automate our deploys in this way. And while we're at twice weekly deploys now, uh, we're able to inch closer and closer to continuous delivery. At this point, it's mostly team process that would need changing for that. And I have to emphasize that we got this completely for free on Cloud Foundry. Doing this sort of automation and uh, deploy process at Blue Box would have been a huge undertaking. And so that's what security and deployments look like for us in 2016 on Cloud Foundry. As Glenn went over, PCF on AWS was great. We really didn't know what we were missing. But then the bills started coming in, and wow, was it expensive. Our first month's bill came in around 80,000. We were tracking towards the million dollar spend for the year. The previous year was closer to 300,000. We were able to use the power and flexibility of PCF to find a cheaper EC2 configuration that got the monthly spend to around 55,000. And we saved another 10,000 by moving our CI environment to EC2 spot instances. But that was still costing us around 45,000 a month. 50% more than we were paying on Blue Box. But hey, we were running on PCF, and it was supposed to make it easier to switch cloud providers. So we went cloud shopping, but with a much bigger cart than that. And ended up on GCP. The move was much easier, and was done in about a quarter of the time, since we were already on PCF. However, we did need to learn a few IaaS nuances and moving data was still hard and time consuming. But we ended up with a 50% cost savings from AWS, a monthly spend of around 22,000, even cheaper than we were on Blue Box. And we got the flexibility, extra flexibility, since we didn't have to use reserve instances to save money. With the added bonus of better network performance, especially in Europe and Asia. 
And that was our journey to the cloud and how we avoided the million dollar AWS bill. We're still on GCP and happy, but Tamar, Azure? Just kidding, unless you're from Microsoft, then we're not kidding. <laughs> Anybody from Google, we're, we're definitely kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.